Alrighty, hi guys. Welcome back to another episode of the Marine Bio Movie Club. This week we are going to be discussing Dam to Extinction, which is a documentary highlighting the struggles of the orcas in the Pacific Northwest, the southern resident killer whales, and essentially the idea of breaching the salmon dam or the dams that are restricting the salmon from completing their life cycle, basically. Yeah. Um, and so this is one that Kendra recommended that we watch and I actually found it super cool. I hadn't ever seen it before. I knew of the issues with the Southern resident whales and the movement to breach the dams from you and from other people that I know that are really passionate about the orcas. And so I knew about the issue, but I think for me, the documentary really highlighted how ridiculous it is that it hasn't been done yet if that makes sense yeah so it was an interesting watch for me because it brought up a lot of cool topics that we can discuss just either applying to the southern resident orcas or just to science in general Mm -hmm. but um it was definitely something that even though i knew about i would definitely recommend that people watch this yeah because it brought, even for me, who already kind of knew about the issue, it really made me be like, why is this not done yet? <laughs> but. I like that it's like a, it's a 15 minute, easy to understand breakdown of the damn issue, which is just one part of what's going on. Right. Like Ken Balcom hinted at the issue of paternity and genetic diversity, mm-hmm. which is a big thing. I mean, he just came out with a really sad article in February I want to say where he basically feels like it's all is lost because of the lack of genetic diversity that we're facing even if we were able to feed the whales that we have now they may not even be at reproductive we'd basically like functionally extinct basically yeah we're kind of reaching that that precipice where if we're not getting them fed and getting the population to go back up and that just their genetics are getting so muddled with like kind of interbreeding in a way like Mm -hmm. I think it's there's three males I always quote this and I still haven't just pulled up. It was the in the article. documentary. I, he said, I think it's like only five of the females have had babies in the last like decade. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, there's only like 15 or so that have had young in the last like 30 years. And there's yeah. only like 20 something females in the Southern resident population. I have only like some, I think it was three or four productive males basically their population is not doing good because they don't even necessarily have yeah the number of whales to create enough genetic diversity at the moment there's 75 young yeah there's 75 individuals mostly males and non-reproducing females and he's told the government folks that for the next 20 to 30 years you have no if we have no chain we have no chance of an increased population and he means a seriously viable population because there were only five successful births in 2015, none in 2016, none in 2017, one in 2018, one in 2019, 2020, we had two, 2021, we have one. L125 was born this year and being named right now. <laughs> I mean, that's exciting. So it's super exciting when there are babies, but there's these huge gaps between the non-reproductive it's not females happening out of and upcoming rep- yeah upcoming reproductive females yeah. and like there have been no calves born in k-pod since 2011 and yeah. that like i saw k37 rain shadow when i was here last summer mm-hmm. he was born in 2004 and there are only 21 reproductive females left in the entire population out of 74 Mm -hmm. Um, and only 10 have had successful births in the last 10 years. And from that only, I think like four or five of the males are fathering these calves. Yeah. Well, towards the end, um, the little girl that's kind of highlighted in the film, I was like, yes, it was so cute, but like clearly knows her stuff, but she, She um, she was chatting about how all her, like, this was my favorite whale. And then he died. And so then this was my favorite whale. Yeah, double And stuff. then he died. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, I feel that. Because I definitely, like, the first, th- the first note I wrote down was, photo ID. <laughs> <laughs> I 
um, which is something that I sort of like, I wouldn't say specialize in, but head our photo ID program yeah. um, out here. Which was like sharks. my favorite part of One Ocean. <laughs> yeah. So I love, like, I love photo ID. I think it's a really cool tool to be able to get to know unique individuals and super non-invasive. And obviously with orcas, it's probably, if nothing else, it might even be easier than stuff with sharks because they naturally have patterning. Yeah. Um, but I was like, it's really cool that that's kind of how it all started essentially is you had a couple individuals that like really loved the whales and started photographing them and they notice differences well, also between individuals. started because of, it, because of the captive industry is a bit of a strong claim, but that is when that started, when Michael Big um, really did start documenting the Southern residents mm -hmm. was during like the Pen Cove capture era. Yeah. So it is cool though. I mean, obviously like the captivity part, not so cool. But the idea of being able to use yeah. photo ID yeah. instead of things like tagging and stuff is just, it's cool. I mean, yeah. it's clearly easier to do something like that in a very distinct population, like with the Southern residents, because they're, I mean, they do travel to some degree, but not really. Yeah. Um, but it was super cool to kind of like see that process with other species. And it's kind of similar to what we do, just slightly different, you know? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so that was cool. But uh, it was definitely, I was like, oh, well, I have favorite sharks. So it's kind of cool that like they have their favorite whales, you know? And like, I know you do, but it's yeah. fun. Yeah, mine's like K-Pod, but specifically K-37 Rain Shadow and then his mom, Sequim. Yeah. I like them. But it's cool to kind of like get to know them. Like you get to know them as individuals too. And they were kind of talking about that. If you spend enough time watching them, you can understand who's friends with who and who has dynamics with others. And I'm sure that part is super cool with the Southern residents, like with the sharks, you get to know their personality because they, they do have those as unique yeah. individuals, but they don't have the same social structure. So I imagine it's probably even like, as much as I love it for the sharks, I'm sure it's even like more fun for the orcas because you can actually see like the social bonds between them as well as just their personality yeah well and alexandra morton who is like a killer biologist and fisheries i think she's kind of technically a fisheries scientist now working with like the, the salmon farming Ooh. issues up here was she in the film no okay. but she, she she's in others but she's talked she has like this quote that i love that basically i love in a sad way but it's like if we lose the southern residents it'll be the first population we've ever lost where we knew all their names I mean, we named them, but like, we'll know each of them yeah. Yeah, um, that is more sad. intimately that way because yeah. these researchers have been working with them for years. <laughs> it, is it is sad. But yeah, so they talk about photo ID off the bat, which I thought was super cool. Um, if anyone ever goes to Friday Harbor, you can go and see the Orca Survey Project. They have a super cool. cool like little showroom where you can come in and they have like a VR set and they tell you how photo ID works, how other research methods work and different like conservation statuses of the different populations up here. That's really there's cool. Four different populate, four different ecotype populations. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. And then they're just kind of talking about the whales or like mentioning certain things. They were talking about how it's a matriarchal society, which is something that we've kind of already discussed a little bit and their dialects and all of that sort of stuff, which um, if you guys wanna hear us go more in depth into that sort of stuff, we've discussed that in I believe our Blackfish episode. They also talk about how like essentially the pod all was established from one matriarch, which I thought was really, I mean, obviously it makes sense, but I thought that was super cool. Um, they also were like, she was estimated to be like 105 when she finally passed away. She's not. Oh, she's so not. This is, yeah, I can actually do some debunking here. Um, and yeah, I can debunk explain. debunk away because I don't know. <laughs> I have to pull up. Um, my friend has like a really good post about it. Um, so yeah, there was this theory. There's also another thing they made in like con contingency with that that is also then debunked with the story as well, saying okay. that like sons never live, leave. The male killer Oh yeah, they did say like, oh, the the calves never leave their moms it's technically like, oh. not always true so do killer whales live to be 100 years old it is 
The answer would be probably not, but it's complicated. You can't just like overarching say, but it originated. They're talking about J2 or um, Granny is what Mm -hmm. she's called. She's right here on my my glass. J2. This is not a glass. My hydro flask. (laughs) Same thing. Um, I knew what you meant. Yeah, she was a beloved member of the Southern resident Kitherell population in Washington and British Columbia and was supposedly over a century years old when she passed away in late 2016. When the Center for Whale Research did their studies in the 70s, they basically like estimated how old they thought she was. Mm. And so they yeah. estimated, she was already an adult when the research began. Estimating the age of an adult whale is difficult because a 20-year-old killer whale will look the same as a 50-year-old adult. And Granny was never seen with the young calf, so researchers assumed she was at least 40 years old, which is the age when a female stops reproducing, when they first saw her in 1971. She also had a very close relationship with the male known as J1 Ruffles. Ruffles was estimated to be 20 years old in 1971 and was thought to be her last surviving calf. So you did some math. That means she was born around 1911. And then when she, she would have died around 105 years old, but Ruffles was not her son. Mm. A study that came out in 2011 showed there was no relation between granny and Ruffles. He was, she was not his mom. Another study published in 2018 so these are all recent. That's why it's not in the, in the so movie. So how? He's actually a member of L-Pod, not J-Pod. Okay. How are they doing like DNA testing to get that information? Yeah. So he, they were able to get. Is um, he still alive? No, he died. He died oh, okay. shortly after she died. Okay. So she disappeared and he basically did the same. And that does happen when a mom, when a female with male calves dies the male's lifespan drastically decreases Mm. and so even though he wasn't her genetic son he basically was treating that relationship like she was his mom um which would make sense why from observational data versus like dna yeah you're going to assume how did they make dead whales dna uh sometimes they'll wash up i actually do think he washed up or now we can do feces collection Mm. edna um, in the water column. Right. I don't know how much they do that out here, but I know that's happening with the sharks mm-hmm. um, in many places. Yeah. And with like manta rays and all that. So if she was, so yeah, the new assumption is that she was around 80, 85 when she passed, which okay. is still long. Oh yeah. Not a hundred. <laughs> Way longer than claimed in captivity. Yeah. If anyone wants to learn more about killer whales, my amazing friend, the Northern naturalist, that's where I got this information from her cool. post. She's my favorite, my favorite killer whale person on the planet. Even, even if they had said 85, I'd still be like, damn, that's an old whale. It is super, it's super old. Um, but it was just really one of those. Cool. You're like, mm. yeah. And so they kind of, they briefly, I mean, they pull at your heartstrings a little bit in the beginning, you know, they show all these super pas- passionate conservationists and scientists that really care about the animals they have and, the little girl break it to you that they're dying. Yeah, like they definitely. And you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, they definitely uh, sort of really try and like make that baseline connection so that you care about what they're about to talk about. Yeah, I mean, they uh, show like their dialects. They have the one researcher saying like, these are all the different pods, like distinct calls. Mm-hmm. So you're like listening to them. And you yeah, feel really that was attached. cool. I thought that they can like even identify that sort of stuff. I thought was interesting. You want to know more about killer whale calls. Orca Lab in BC is basically all research about killer whale vocalizations. That's so cool. <laughs> but yeah, so super cool. I mean, you know more than me, so... By all means, this well, is, I think this vocalizations Kendra's, are super cool. Yeah, this is Kendra's like love or the southern My baby killer whales. Besides like tinafores and starfish, right. I have a very drastic difference in fauna. Extremely like. large <laughs> megafauna and real tiny real invertebrates. Tiny, <laughs> under underappreciated. I appreciate that. Under researched tinafores. Yeah. But so they really pull at your heartstrings when they try and get you invested. And then they begin to sort of talk about the issue with the salmon and overfishing and sort of what that looks like. And then on top of that, then they sort of go into the dam example. And for me, I wanted to sort of like touch just a little bit on the overfishing because they made a point prior to when they get into talking about, well, at this point, we're maybe not overfishing them the same degree, but we've got the whole dam stuff. But they talk about how nowadays, they're not finding the same size of fish or the same mature age of fish as what they used to find decades ago. Yeah. And that's something that we have seen 
across oceans, across marine environments when it comes to overfishing, because typically what's happening is larger fish are targeted. When those larger fish run out, they're still going to target other fish. And yeah. so we're seeing that fish just aren't able to reach the same like level of maturity because they're being taken out of the ocean essentially before that's even possible. And that's a huge issue that we're seeing not only with sharks, but with just fish species in general. Tuna is that, a big one. Yeah, tuna is a huge one. Fish are being taken out before they're even given the opportunity to reproduce. Yeah, well, and even with mammals, there's a study that came out last week or within the last month, but I saw it last week about the Northern Atlantic right whales. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing research on their size and they are getting smaller and smaller as these years go from human impact, like getting caught in a net that basically yeah. will stunt their growth for years to come. So when like, and we like, I don't know, when I was in biology as a kid, I learned about hunting and how like bears and coyotes and wolves work and they pick off the weakest. They don't go for that mm -hmm. strong elk or the strong that's deer. not how humans do it. That's not how we do it. We go for those big ones. So they're not able to reproduce and make other big ones. Right. With deer as well. And now in the ocean, because mm -hmm. we want those like big tuna, the big salmon, it's like right. big swordfish, whatever it is. Um, well, that's more profitable for us. So that's what we aim to, but we're essentially disrupting natural selection where those animals may have been more fit. And we're basically causing genetics to select for mm -hmm. the opposite yeah essentially what we do so i just want. thought that was kind of interesting that and it's really cool salmon are such an interesting species to look at because we've really learned to understand their life cycle and yeah. so we kind of know exactly where all of these different stages are occurring and so it's almost like a closed system in a way that you can really see like, oh, we are seeing less and less larger animals or less and less just in general. Whereas I feel like sometimes with those pelagic species like the tuna or whatever it may be, when it's out in the deep open ocean, because it's not as much of a closed system, it's almost harder to quantify. Well, maybe like, it's easier to throw in excuses like, oh, well, maybe we're just not in the area where the big fish are. Mm -hmm. Or maybe this little group that we found isn't as much, you know, like it's not as much of a very obvious, no, we're seeing this distinct population that only lives in this area have these issues. Yeah. So I don't know, I thought that was interesting, but salmon in general, I mean, they're a good example of kind of what we talked about in the previous episode when we discussed happy feet and establishing like MPAs, they're another good example of the complexity of establishing what is the best thing to do yeah. to protect that animal because they do have their different life stages in such different locations. They do. Well, and the Salish Sea was just declared a hope spot by like Sylvia Earle's Mission Blue organization, um, which is like basically like trying to double down the efforts of getting these places to have more protections it doesn't right. like technically mean it's mostly much. just like hey we want to focus on this more yeah it's like this is an important part of our ocean like important things are happening here in terms of like keystone species like mm -hmm. some residents there's sea otter conservation kelp forests there's issues with the kelp it's just a great it's an amazing ecosystem that yeah we have protection. all kinds of problems um but yeah it's one of those where because salmon, like you're going up the rivers, they're coming out. They, there's all kind like that's where, yeah, the MPA would be hard to sit down. Well, not even that, even just when they are talking about, okay, this is what we've determined is the best thing to do when they're talking mm -hmm. about breaching the dams. It was cool to hear them talk about the process of how they determined that yeah. in a way, because they talk about how, well, they spawn up here and then they swim down here and then they go up here and then they turn around and come back. To, you know, like they talk yeah. about how they have those different life stages in such different locations. Uh, but it was cool to see them sort of break down, even though they have all these different life stages, this is what needs to happen to benefit all of this. And yeah. so that's kind of a cool approach where they could have easily said, almost in like an overwhelming fashion, we have to protect every single one of these zones, 
but they were able to really nail it down and say, if we protect this one area, if we make this one specific change in this one area, that's going to make the greatest impact overall. Instead yeah, of it can improve by such and such. Percentage. Yeah, which must I would imagine when it does come to approaching government agencies and the places responsible for putting things like the dams in place makes it an easier sell in a way to be like, we just want to fix this one part yeah. of this whole huge area that they're using. We're not saying we need a hundred percent. We just need this little 5% because that's going to make a big difference. Yeah. Well, currently there there's, there's still the focus for lower, like the all four snake river dams, but there's a particular pressure to get that first one taken care of within the next year. Mm-hmm. And then the rest it would be nice to see them done before 10 years, but there is a bill proposed by an Idaho congressman who did propose a bill for breaching the dams in the next 10 years, which is good, That's but awesome. we need it faster than that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 10 years is too long. 10 years is way too long, especially mm-hmm. at the state at which we see the orcas right now. Yeah. But yeah, so they talk about how essentially the dams... They've determined that the dams are sort of the big issue because it's inhibiting an important part of the life stage of the salmon. Yeah. And I really thought, I liked how it was news to me because I think one of the scientists brought up a good point of people that state, oh, well, the dams have like fish bridges and things. So why why are we seeing this issue where the salmon, like the salmon can still get up the river and that honestly, like, I will say, I didn't know a lot about mm. that. So I'm, I was, I knew the dams were an issue still, Yeah. but I thought that things like the fish bridges and things like that were still really valuable, um, which I'm sure they are. Yeah. To, I mean, but, some fish go up them. I've seen yeah, it. Yeah. But I was unaware that the actual issue was more in that juvenile stage with them coming back down the river. Yeah which makes a whole lot of sense after hearing it, but I was just completely unaware of that happening. Um, Well, there's another salmon threat I don't really think they brought up because it's, actually, I don't know why, but there's like the issue of the salmon farms out here. Yeah, and Um, the disease. and Yeah, and all the diseases that they carry that when the the young that do survive and get down, then get completely run over by basically these sea lice Mm -hmm. and like the sea lice kill them super fast when they're little. There's a really good book yeah. about it. <laughs> I've definitely heard of that where like the farmed fish are basically. Yeah. If you want like a breakdown of it from. Immunocompromising like it... the wild caught fish. Yeah. Well, if you want, there's like a really good book called, it's by Alexandra Morton, who I mentioned earlier, called Not On My Watch. It just came out a couple months ago, but she breaks down her whole journey. She moved up here to study the, nor- the Northern resident population mm-hmm. and ended up just working basically with Um, no with the fish she's been working in the salmon industry even since like they first started building up like we're just getting the traction to get rid of them now yeah uh but she's been on it and been around people like basically since i want to say the 80s is when it first kind of started going up and it was companies from the norway salmon farming industry coming down Mm -hmm. here and doing putting in their own salmon farms yeah it's very interesting because she paints the whole picture it's not just like it sucks Mm -hmm. now she's like I'm going to paint you the picture of how it gradually became worse to the point where like, oh yeah. Yeah. Like, hello. I mean, Sea Shepherd had a whole campaign just aimed at these salmon farms. Yeah. And I think too, um, obviously that's a clear thing. It seemed like the documentary was just really trying to push for the issue of the dams. And so I imagine that's probably why they didn't go into the other stuff. The full story because people just hear breach the dams and they're just like, watch why. Especially yeah. like you think it's good energy and they're just like, mm-hmm. and that um, was a point they made where they're like, this energy is not effective and it costs way more than what yeah. it's worth basically, which I thought was such a good point because I think so many people, when it comes to conservation, they're like, well, we're going to lose money if we do this, or we're not going to be able to make as much money if we do this. And this was a really good example of that's not necessarily the case in every situation. Yeah. And for me, it was almost like mind boggling. Why is there so much resistance to doing this? 
You know what I mean? Like if, yeah. it's, so if it's costing all of this money, it's not helping you make more money. If anything, it's making you lose money. Why are there still people that are sitting in their conference hall talking to government agencies and representatives going, we need the dams. The dams yeah. bring us electricity. You're like, ah. What's the thing like the wind and solar could replace the energy by the dams like sixfold. If they breached yeah. the dams, they would see a five-fold increase in tourism, fishing activities, and just outdoor mm -hmm. recreation within the next 10 years. Because, you know, your fish would come it's back. It's way more They're beautiful. Whaling, like not whaling, like killing whales. L whale watching. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> like those kind of things. Yeah like there there are so there many so much more benefit to yeah there's so many things that would help like getting rid of these would not yeah. only like you get a better energy source but you'd also see more money coming in through other avenues or just for tourism. sure but we'll say ecotourism because we prefer ecotourism right yeah but i mean yeah it's interesting i thought it was a good point that they made where because of the dams these juvenile fish are basically they're not because their journey down the river is taking so much longer they're not able to get to the ocean in time for their bodies to be able to make the physiological switch from a freshwater fish to a saltwater fish yeah and if you haven't studied like animal physiology and the difference between a fresh and a saltwater fish that doesn't seem like that big of a deal it's complete opposite yeah. from, a, from each other, which, you know, makes sense because they're opposite environments, but for an animal's body to be able to make that switch over is a lot. When salmon's bodies do so much, I mean, from birth to death, I mean, basically they're just going through like physical changes constantly. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like look physiological change, crazy after, physiological when they change die. after physiological change. <laughs> Yeah. They turn into like these humpbacked red. It's like a shell of a human. It's a shell of a fish, basically. Yeah, like they look wild. Like I think people envision that salmon when they think mm -hmm. of salmon, but salmon basically look like trout. Oh yeah. When they're just out and about. Or maybe that's how people view them. And I just, I always thought of like the big red and green I always, salmon. I envision brother bear salmon. <laughs> Which I think are Actually, they the. they are red. They're the yeah, red they're... with like the long nose and kind of the humped face. Yeah. Obviously, when you go to the grocery store, they just have like the silver salmon. But I always was like, yeah. oh, they're these big, nasty looking, cool looking fish. Yeah, for they sure. They look pretty normal for a good chunk of their life, but they physically change from juvenile going into the ocean, ocean, yeah. let's get back into fresh water, breed, and then insane. Just die. It's insane. It's insane. Their but, life cycle is metal. Oh, it, it, it's crazy. But I think that was such like, for me, that was at least as from a scientific perspective, I was like, oh that's a big deal mm -hmm. for them to miss that window you know like not just because at first I was like where are they going with this you know I was I was watching it and I was listening and they were saying like well it's harder for the fish and a lot of them die and so for me I was kind of like oh is that the point like they just need to figure out because I was like oh well maybe Stop we dying. can keep the dams well I was like maybe we can keep the dams but figure out a better way to get the juvenile fish through the dams. Like I was mm -hmm. like, oh, maybe that could work. But then when they were talking about how it just prolongs the like travel period to the point where they can't make that physiological change, I was like, yeah. oh, no, that's a, it's a much bigger issue than just we're losing a great number of them by getting cut up by turbines or whatever, you know, yeah, <laughs> the actual structure. It's more about the delay of the life cycle basically yeah and that's the thing then there's so many layers to the issue and even then i'm just like and that's just if they make it out once they make it out there's a plethora oh, of other yeah. things happening forget all the they gotta make natural it world stuff like up. other animals eating them <laughs> yeah like the ones that won't make it back up to breed and the fact we have less of a population there's more demand from the killer whales and it's not just killer whales that eat chinook salmon no it's um, a lot of stuff there's a lot of animals that eat salmon. I mean, the transients up here kill the salmon for fun. They don't eat it. Just, I mean, yeah. the, the Southern residents kill porpoises for fun and they don't eat them. Uh, they could, they might start yeah. living a little better, but I wonder if they here would. Nor there. there hasn't been any case of them eating um, 
from my understanding any kind well, of because that would essentially turn the residents into transients, transients. yeah they could be i mean be, diet wise obviously diet, like, well, yeah they could just like diversify their diet a bit i mean because chinook salmon is 80 percent of their diet there are other fish species that they prey on besides just chinook mm-hmm. salmon there's like a whole study about it but the chinook are the vast majority of what they're eating yeah chinook is the the primary form of primary fish in their diet right yeah because i mean we talked about this again with happy feet where animals were changing their diet essentially because of the lack of the main source of their diet yeah so i wonder if that's something that we could potentially see which obviously has bad cascade effect effects in the rest of the ecosystem yeah that'd be 75 more mouths eating the same thing as the the transient population which has been booming oh really they are baby making machines up here it's crazy they really interesting yeah they've had they're going they're good they're great I mean that's good to Mm -hmm. hear yeah doesn't mean anything for the southern residents but it's great for the transients it is we have some killer whales that are doing great up here yeah so but yeah so they talk about the dams one of the things I wanted to mention which isn't necessarily like a marine science point of view but just like the socio-political economic idea of basically removing indigenous peoples from their home Mm -hmm. it's another thing that's talked about in that book I mentioned yeah which like surprise salmon farms like basically pay everyone off yeah and take over well, and two, surprise, surprise that the U.S. military is going to take over without asking. Yeah, real shocker there. Um, but I thought that w- I, I am happy that the film highlighted that as, hey, this isn't just a, we're trying to save the animals. We like the it's also, whales. Yeah, it's also, there were some actual like human effects that were not addressed. Yeah. Well, and the indigenous people up here play a big part in like Southern resident conservation, but even in the mission to like free Lolita, the Southern Mm -hmm. resident that's still in captivity in Florida, the like huge part of those efforts. And so if there were films that didn't involve them, it'd basically be like, why? Like, yeah, you're ignoring a huge part of the fight to save these killer whales. Yeah. And orcas had actually have such a huge cultural significance in those communities yeah for many so it doesn't surprise me that those communities are trying to speak up for the animals yeah there's I can't I don't remember which one it is but I I don't know if it's multiple um but there's like there is an, a legend or whatever that the um tribal leaders turn into the great killer whales when they die mm-hmm. and that's who the killer whales are very um, aqua yeah there's sort of and there's a ton of like these legends history that are tied to the killer whale and like an immense respect for these creatures that animal yeah yeah i mean the name for killer whale in oh my gosh i think haida is skana Mm s-k-a-n-a and it has a bunch of different translations one is like one can kind of be like demon because yeah, they like these killer whales devil fish basically yeah but there's also ones that are just like uh chief and all that i forget there's like very forget righteous the, yeah. yeah like respecting of their killer nature well i think from my understanding and i obviously can't speak for the indigenous community over there but from my understanding it was sort of we respect this devil fish as the chief of the ocean. Like we respect the so. capable nature of the animal, but highly regard it as well. I think you know? that, I think that's, I don't remember. I have, I have books about um, like indigenous legends and stories mm-hmm. in Arizona and I haven't read them in a while, but they do talk about it in Free Willy, which is surprisingly a good film with talking about. Oh yeah. Specifically they, the Randall in Free mm-hmm. Willy is uh, he's, he's Haida I'm like 95% sure and he talks about one of the legends yeah but I mean that makes sense to me that they would want I'm happy that they highlighted them is more so what I'm what I was trying to say is that it's I think it was important that they address 
the dams from the perspective of conservation, but also just like. Well, it's especially good when we look at other films that have come out that don't do that. And it's very possible to do that. Question anything about Sailor Sea conservation that does not involve indigenous voices. I would question a lot of conservation things. Oh, that for do not sure. include any form of indigenous voices. Yeah. But, and that's on that. <laughs> but um, I think towards the end, they sort of look, they sort of talk about like the economic and political issues associated with the idea of breaching the dams. My big note is I freaking hate politicians. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. In a perfect world, there would be no politics and conservation. We would just all agree that yeah. we should help save the ocean or save the planet. Clearly that's it's, not the reality of how things work. Sadly. But they were simultaneously kind of showing like these clips of politicians saying, we need the dams, we can't breach the dams while also showing voices of people that were like, these dams suck. Like, hello, here's the data to prove it. Mm -hmm. And it really like does shine a light on sort of the twisted nature when it comes to trying to get things like bills. Well, they mentioned things like subsidies again. And I was just about to bring that up oh. because I don't like subsidies. <laughs> I think we're kind of at this point right now when it comes to things like subsidies, whether it be for commercial fishing, like in situations like we talked about with Seaspiracy, or whether it be for things like transporting wheat down a river, like they were talking about here in um, this film. Right now we're sort of having this problem where for such a long time, we subsidized these industries to try and make them financially stable mm -hmm. or financially suitable. And in doing so, we essentially subsidized really horribly, in, like not environmentally friendly yeah. acts. I mean, same can be said with like the meat industry. Like I'm mm -hmm. not like go vegan, anti-meat, yeah, but not. there is a huge issue with subsidies within the meat industry. Oh, within versus... the agriculture industry and the fisheries and there's the so agriculture industry, stuff. I could literally just talk forever because I have, yeah. I, I had, a, oh my gosh, there's so many issues from every standpoint. Every but facet, yeah. That's why like it's such a struggle and it, it is very privileged to tell people to go vegan because a lot of, in a lot of places, in e most places in the US, mm -hmm. yeah. meat is subsidized where it is cheaper to get more regularly right. than a lot of fruits and vegetables or at least alternatives. Like if meat alternatives were subsidized, going vegan- And that's sort of my thing where I'm like, Okay. I'm not saying let's get rid of the subsidies, but can we not try and subsidize these industries for choosing more sustainable options? Yeah. So instead of subs, like, okay, right now for in this example that was given in the film, wheat farmers have been given subsidies to use boat transportation down the river. Why don't we subsidize them to use the railways instead? Mm. or and I obviously that's a very simplified yeah but I mean look at like fishing that. it's a much There's... more complicated issue yeah but hey okay so we're subsidizing in commercial fisheries all right we're subsidizing fishermen for using these methods and not catching enough and we're subsidizing whatever is remaining or how you know whatever degree it is what if we provided initiatives to subsidize sustainable fishing practices. Yeah. Well, that's like what there's the big movement to just get. And that's why I think it's important to be like harmful subsidies. Cause mm -hmm. it's like blanket statementing anything is, is not the best. In yeah. Most I don't cases. hate subsidies. I hate heart. Yeah. Harmful subsidies. Like, cause there is like a, a distinction. Oh, there's a between very the big two. difference. Like this is a case. Subsidies where I like, feel like could be an awesome thing. Like, even if you look at things like energy, yeah. Let's subsidize renewable energy. That could be a great way. Or for companies that produce plastic, what if I subsidized you to use glass? You know, like yeah. little things like that. Yeah. Which obviously, and again, it's, 
I am aware that it's not as easy as saying, Hey, instead of so do you, it <laughs> like, it's not that easy. It's a much more complicated issue than that. Yeah. And would love to talk to someone that sort of specializes in understanding the complexity of subsidies in various topics, but we're sort of at this turning point where we need to stop using these harmful subsidies yeah, as like an excuse, pushing. or at least try and create some sort of incentive. Yeah, that's like what. Yeah, just finding other ways to because we like, know just throughout history unless people can make money off of it or they don't want to do are it. not going to lose money off of it people are very resistant to change especially if it's going to cost them money yeah you know um it's a lot about economics and that's something that i always tell students i'm like as much as conservation is like a passionate thing and a passion project you have to be aware that the world sort of revolves around money and it's in a sense. And so you have to be aware that, or your argument is going to be better if you can prove you're including it. it has economic value. I mean, that's kind of like the secret with grant writing. It's not really a secret, but I'm just like a good it makes grant, your grant writing proposal. Effective. Yeah. When you're laying out like an entire budget, same mm -hmm. is going to go for like a conservation project. If you have a budget, like break it down and mm -hmm. then if even then like have some kind of maybe have some kind of data that shows the positive that will come from investing money so you're getting a return like it sucks you kind of have to do that but if you, you kind of do like you're going to get a return from saving this population from conserving yeah. a, a habitat and it doesn't sound super like conservation-y but it's so much more effective when you can do that because people like instant gratification like seeing mm -hmm. they're going to get rewarded from something past just a little clap, oh a for little sure tap on the back yeah but yeah so they kind of end the documentary and talking about that and they make a lot of really good points that the dams are not economically effective yeah which we kind of already touched on but and so I think for me I was like what I, the documentary was great and just being like why why the hell do we still have these things yeah um, there's I've seen like a couple like pro dam things I've never read into them fully yet mostly because well I don't actually the know. point that the documentary made at least and like you said I haven't read them either so I can't speak exactly how creditable they are yeah but the documentary was basically like the numbers that they're presenting to you are if not completely false very twisted yeah or maybe just like old yeah that could be like part of it and I thought it, it was a good I thought it was a good point one of the scientists said he's like oh these booms and salmon that the politicians are talking about why don't you go talk to the fishermen that fish for salmon yeah that was what funny. they have to say and I was like he's like go off like <laughs> and like the salmon that is such a real fisherman. thing though not yeah they're and like part of it those are the numbers I am curious to find and like see what that means. What maybe they consider it's a boom. Yeah. And maybe it's just from like a previous year, the last mm -hmm. 10 years in which the dams initially tanked mm -hmm. and then they've kind of come back or there've been other efforts that have made things come back. But like, Hey, like, Oh, dams, we're kind of the dams before we put the bridges in. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or, Oh, we're kind of getting rid of the salmon farms now. So the wild salmon are improving, like that kind of stuff. I'm like, like something there, that's maybe other factors. the health of the salmon maybe aren't correlated to something that has to do with the dams, but they're going to claim. Yeah, you I mean, you can I mean? make a vague comment about that with anything. You'd be like, well, this boomed. Okay, well, that's because someone else is doing something, right? Not you. Yeah, for I think sure. that's happened with other projects. I can't oh, think I'm of sure. anything, but I've heard like similar things where they're that like, may, uh, yeah, you're not giving all the details to your numbers there yeah well you're essentially taking credit for conservation work that's happening in other areas yeah and claiming that like oh well our thing isn't an issue anymore because it's getting better like well it would yeah. get a lot better if your issue wasn't there <laughs> your issue just it was demolished and gone goodbye yeah that'd be really great but yeah so um i want to link some petitions and different resources and things and kendra will hopefully help me put those together I a little know bit so many <laughs> she probably has a whole list already um, but i'll link a lot of that in the description below so if anyone is wanting to get involved in the movement to breach the dams or just learn more about the southern residents and the things that are affecting them and that we can help with i will link that all below 
Um, so go check that out. In two weeks, we are going to be discussing Jaws, which is a film that, believe it or not, neither of us have actually seen the entire thing. So it'll be fun for us to kind of wash it with fresh eyes and give you our perspective and hopefully shed a little bit of light on essentially the movie that sort of brought Shark's reputation to the forefront of people's minds, I would say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the so we're super excited. Fear. Yes. So we're super excited to discuss Jaws and I will try and do a better job of making sure everything is on time. <laughs> and um, yeah, so until next time, we will see you guys when we discuss Jaws. Bye.